I'm Greg Meyer. Uh, I'm the director of market research for Anytime Fitness and Waxing the City. So Anytime Fitness is a franchise uh, organization that we run multiple brands, multiple businesses. Um, so when I started with the company, it was just a gym, fitness oriented business, and now it's body waxing and all that stuff. So that's a new, new area for me. So um, here's a quick agenda of what I want to cover. I think we'll fully cover the next 75 minutes. Uh, this is a hopefully value add to you because I'll give you a little bit of perspective on my career, things that I've learned, uh, things that I do within market research. Um, but I'll also tell you about specific examples of work that I've done so you kind of get a, a real world flavor for what market research is uh, for businesses today. So. I'll do a quick intro. Um, I'll kind of make some ties to market research to marketing because when people ask me what I do, I view myself as a marketer, but my role within marketing is market research because those things tie together hand in hand. Um, and then we'll go into some market research applications. So I have three examples that I want to share with you. We're actually going to go in inverse order. So we'll talk about um, some customer experience work at Anytime Fitness. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, research that I did while prepping like the Best Buy Super Bowl ads over the last couple of years. And then I'll show you how research and insights kind of informs a brand strategy. So with what you're going to do as an organization, who your customer is, how you're going to talk to them, how you're going to provide value to them, and it's all led by, uh, led by research. And then if there's time permitting, you guys can ask me any questions or talk to me offline or whatever. Um, so I, I've seen this, uh, this quote a few times now. Um, being in the fitness industry, they use it a lot. And I think it's applicable to you guys as students as you graduate and as you go into your career. That it's not about finding what you want to do necessarily. And again, if any of this conflicts what you read in your textbook or your professor tells you, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's about creating yourself. And why I think that's important to you guys is that once you graduate or while you're moving toward graduations, you got to figure out like, what are those things that I'm going to develop? What are the skills that I'm going to have that make me marketable as an individual? And that doesn't stop once you graduate. It doesn't stop once you have your first job. Like you have to continually think one step ahead to figure out how am I going to do what I want to do next? Because if you don't start having these conversations, or if you don't start thinking about it this way, you're gonna be complacent. You're gonna kind of be stuck in the same kind of role, same kind of business, et cetera. Um, so how are you creating yourself? How I look at how you create yourself as an individual and how I've kind of done it within my career is I break it down like this, and this is just my crude kind of drawing and how I look at it um, within my world. Maybe there's something you can pull apart from here, but. Um, you gotta think about what you do in your job. Like, what are your core responsibilities? If you're a consumer insights person, what are you paid to do? Are you paid to write surveys, do data analysis, do something like that? You know, what do you do? And be very intimate in terms of how you do it. The next thing is kind of figure out your strengths and weaknesses. Now, no matter how good you are, you do have weaknesses. And no matter what your job is, you have strengths that apply. And the more quickly you can understand what these are, the easier it is to figure out where you match with a career, where you match with a company, where you match with a job. And then lastly, is you kind of fill in these gaps with training and development. And you take these things and you kind of put them in, I call them the gonculator, and you can start figuring out like your roadmap. And I had this epiphany probably three different times in my career. The first time was when I was sitting in a similar classroom to this, and I was like, man, what do I want to, how do I want to take this? What do I want to do? How do I start mapping out my career? And I started taking year by year and kind of writing down, what do I want to do? How much do I want to make? And what do I have to do to kind of achieve those things in terms of where I work and what I want to do? Um, as I started doing it, and the more times I've done it, I've realized that, you know, do I want to be doing market research all my life? Do I want to be in marketing all my life? You know, and that's where I kind of stumbled upon being an adjunct professor is because I realized that it was getting longer and longer and I was doing the same thing. And I, I kind of pumped the brakes and I was like, well, I got to figure out what I want to do differently. 
And I was kind of going through this exercise. It kind of helped me craft my story. And I think this is important to you guys because if you know your story, if you know where you're strong, you know where you're weak, you know what you want to do, it helps you write resumes and cover letters. It helps you clearly articulate the job you want or the promotion you want. It makes a lot of these things in your career easier to do. So um, that's kind of my rant on career. Now I'll kind of tell you about some of my experiences and kind of how I've used that kind of thinking to formulate my career. So my first job out of high school is I worked at Schwickert's. I wasn't going to go to school. I wasn't going to do anything. I was just going to make money, work, and do whatever I wanted to do. I worked at Schwickert's as a hot tar roofer for 30 days. That fall, I went to school. Um, so I went to MSU. I had three different majors while I was here. I was always in the College of Business. I was a management major. I was an econ major. I was a finance major. And then I kind of stumbled upon marketing. And I had a couple conversations with some of the marketing professors. I talked to some people out in uh, the workplace who did marketing. And I was like, well, it's ambiguous enough to where I could probably find something to do with a marketing degree. But then I started figuring out like there were actually things within marketing that I was passionate about. So then I started working at Midwest Wireless. Does anyone know who, what, who, when Midwest Wireless is? No, one, one person. Uh, so you guys know the building out on 14 where the wireless, or Verizon Customer Care Center is? So that used to be Midwest Wireless. It was a regional cell phone provider. Covered Southern Minnesota, Northern Iowa. Um, and I started there as a research intern. And typically what I did was I read uh, customer satisfaction comments. I coded data. I did analysis. And ultimately it turned into a job. Um, it was bought out by uh, Altel and then by Verizon, so I left the company and I started working up in the cities and I worked for Best Buy. There I started doing data analysis for the video game department, the CD department, and uh, the DVD department. And I kind of started moving around while I was at Best Buy doing a variety of different things. And what I figured out is I didn't want to be isolated into one kind of role. So what are all the different things that a market researcher could do based on what you've seen in your text. So obviously you can do data analysis. What else can you do? You guys haven't read the text, huh? Well, you can do primary research where you're surveying people about what they like, what they think, how satisfied they are. Or you can do focus groups. You can talk to people in a small setting, ask them very pointed things about what they like, what they don't like. Anyways, there's a lot of different things you can do and I realized that I wanted to do all of them. I just didn't want to do one, so I tried to figure out and position myself, how could I do a bunch of those different tasks and be a value add to the organization? Well, Best Buy kind of started to go south, um, and the morale there was really bad, and that's where I took that mapping of what I wanted to do in three years, in five years, in 10 years, and realized that there might be an opportunity to kind of take my experiences and put them into like a teaching role, and that's when I started teaching uh, adjunct and I taught the Marketing 100 class. Kind of brought some of my experiences from Best Buy, Midwest, wherever uh, into the classroom. And then from there I went to Anytime Fitness. So my boss uh, at Best Buy left the organization uh, I went to Anytime Fitness and a couple months later she called me and she's like, you know, I think there's a great opportunity here. I'm building a marketing department. You know, we really need to get, you know, tighter on our marketing strategy and business strategy. So I went to Anytime Fitness. So when I talk about doing any or doing market research, like what does that mean to you? Like how would you define it? Just I know you guys can talk. Just just say a word. Quantitative stuff and qualitative stuff on business. Quantitative, qualitative. What else? Analysis of business in an organization. Yep, business analysis. So there's a lot of things that describe market research. I know that when my wife is talking to friends, family members, whatever, and they ask, well, what does Greg do for a job? And she's kind of like, I don't really know what he does. I think he talks to people and he, he writes surveys and he does stuff like that. So the problem is, is this, this business role or this um, uh, role in an organization is, is very ambiguous. So when I look at all the different words that can describe market research, like there's a lot of things that capture it. Um, I do strategy on any, any given day, talk to the customer 
evaluate the business, tie these stories together into marketing strategy and business direction. So when you think about market research as a role, as a potential career path, you know, I caution you not to look short-sighted because it's not just strictly quantitative analysis. It's not strictly just doing business analysis. It is a lot more of that partner in marketing, strategy development, kind of seat at the table on where the organization is going. Um, and I but, think all of this is tied to what you've said right there with the customer and the behavior, mm -hmm. you know, the orientation of this class of the customer behavior side of it, yep. too. And being able to have very narrow and specific information to work with on the target markets, right? So within my role in various organizations when I've done market research, it kind of maps up the, the three core areas that you guys all mentioned, but also like working with vendors and project management and things like that. Um, so here's just a quick term that you know, I kind of borrowed um, about what market research is, but it is that listening to your customer, figuring out the need, implementing that need within your business, and then monitoring the value that you provide to a customer. And all that is key in terms of having a profitable, sustainable business. So when I tell people, when they ask what I do, I say I'm in marketing. And that's because market research is one of those vital components to the marketing process. So the first thing, in terms of marketing process, like you have to define and understand your target market and the value they want versus the value you can provide. And you only do that by quantitative analysis, focus groups, things like that to help kind of harness that voice of the customer into a reasonable bucket. Second one is you need to determine your value prop. Like what, do you guys know what a value proposition is? So like um, for Best Buy, you know, when they have ads and it says, you know, excellent service, you know, low prices, something like that. So that's kind of their value prop. Um, the next thing is you need to evaluate how you deliver the value to your organization. And the last one is you need to monitor that value. Once you've built the strategy, and once you've put the strategy in place, like it's not set it and forget it, you gotta monitor how that flows within your organization. Um, and it all depends on your asset base. So now I wanna kinda walk you through some examples where you know, I've worked with organizations doing research projects and kinda what happens behind the scenes and how we kind of use it, use that consumer behavior, customer insight to influence decision within an organization. And we're gonna kinda work backwards in order. Um, but we'll start with this one. It kind of has the same framing as that previous slide in terms of market research is part of that marketing process. Um, and we just need to kind of see how that plays out within these individual buckets. So the first one I'm gonna show you is, uh, let's see, is the Anytime Fitness example. And a little background on this work. Um, so Anytime Fitness is a franchise, uh, is a franchise model. And how Anytime Fitness grew up was they were a low cost model and they gave uh, franchisees the autonomy to run their business however they wanted to. And that's great if you were one of the franchisees, but as you grow, and we've grown to 2,200 uh, locations in North America and we're in 17 countries. So you can see as we've grown and as you have more locations, more owners, more countries, controlling the process becomes a little bit um, of like herding cats. So what we needed to do is kind of reset and go, okay, like what are the things that we need to create more standardization around to make sure we're creating a good experience for our customer? And when, we, when you do these types of things as an organization, you're, you're essentially looking for pain points. And what we did was we were trying to find key pain points within our organization in where the customer had a hard time doing business with us. And we found a bunch um, and we wanted to kind of pick off one at a time so that we could create a better experience which leads to a customer doing business longer with you, spending more money, things of that nature. But the problem was is I, we were dealing with 2,000 owners who liked their autonomy and did whatever they wanted to. So we had to position the story as kind of simple and laid out, you know, uh, clearly as possible, but we had to show it through the voice of the customer. So it wasn't corporate is telling you to do this because that creates a little bit of animosity. We had to do it as 
here's how your customer interacts with you, here's what they're looking for, here's what they do, and this is why we need to do this. And that's kind of the stance we took. Um, so I presented this, um, and this is just a snippet of the entire presentation, but I presented this last fall at our annual conference. So there's 1,500 people in the crowd, and, and they're kind of all over the place on their acceptance for corporate policy and different changes that were happening in the organization. So I really wanted to lay this out um, very uh, sequentially. So I started with, it's all about change. And we're trying to show our owners that you know, the world is changing, the customer is changing, and we either change with them or we get left behind. So I wanted to start from a 10,000 foot lens. And I started showing them like how the industry has changed through like obesity, $10 gyms competition, the consumer is changing, which is more or less just how consumers shop. Um, because it was funny, in talking to some of these owners, they still looked at the world in like a 2004, 2005 lens. And when I told them that you know, everyone virtually has a smartphone and everyone does shopping and purchasing on a smartphone, they were like, yeah, but they don't, they don't shop for gyms that way. Like, it was always, yeah, but. So we really had to convince them, like, this is happening. So um, what we did is we started walking through and kind of talked about our experience that we provide, um, which is very inconsistent and that we needed to make it consistent. Um, and I kept going down this path of just consistency and how do you get consistency and the biggest thing for organizations and whether it's Anytime Fitness or another organization, like how they fix problems they have is listening to the customer. And that's why a lot of bigger organizations have teams and departments that manage market research consumer behavior because they get as their strategy evolves and as the customer changes, they need kind of that finger at the pulse of what's actually changing. So I tried to take them out of the fitness industry because they had a lot of yeah buts and they always would rationalize the things they do, the way they run their business. And I made a parallel to the mobile phone industry, which is very similar to the gym industry, whether it's through contracts and things like that. But also I was very familiar with the cellular industry because I worked in it at a couple different places. And we kind of talked about uh, T-Mobile. Um, and T-Mobile has done a lot in terms of their customer experience over the last couple of years to be more customer centric. So if you follow their CEO on Twitter, like he is very customer first. Um, if you talk to anyone in the organization, they are very customer first. And if you look at their financials over the last couple of years, you can tell if you trend the last five years, there was something that changed within their organization and that was how they handled the customer. So we kind of talked and kind of made some of these parables about, or parallels on how, you know, what the customer hated, aka like the pain points they had, and how T-Mobile kind of responded to them. And we we're kind of laying the groundwork for how we wanted the, the audience or our franchisees to think. And we wanted to think, okay, yeah, I understand because I own a mobile phone and I hate being a contract, even though there's that parallel to contracts in the gym industry. Like I want to upgrade, I want to make changes, you know, I want to do all these things. And they were able to kind of put themselves in the in the mindset of a consumer to where if you went guns a blazing and just use the fitness industry as the, as the model, they would have never got there because they would have kept rationalizing why they do what they do. Um, and we kind of asked them, you know, if you follow the CEO of T-Mobile on their website or on Twitter or wherever, like he just says that that's the way they are. Like they listen to the customer because they know, A, like it's the right thing to do, but they also know that if they don't, like they'll die. The bigger organizations will just chew them up and spit them out. So then we made the transition back to the fitness industry. And we did a lot of research, both like we did surveys, um, we did focus groups, uh, we did a couple other things, but the primary thing that we did was a thing called an ethnography. And does your textbook talk about what an ethnography is? It did briefly, in one of the first chapters. Okay, so what an ethnography is, is essentially a one-to-one -one focus group done on the customer's terms. So in their house, at their office, wherever, they answer questions and they videotape themselves uh, on their phones. And the reason you do this is because you want to capture that third person um, persona, but you also want to show the emotion on their face, especially when you poke at them around things that they aren't happy about. So we talked to all these different groups of people and you want to make sure like when you're doing uh, research like this that you make sure that you represent the natural audiences uh, within your target customer. 
Greg, where do you find, like when you do focus groups and things too, um, where do you find your participants? So we recruit them and it's always a, a tricky thing because a lot of, if you see a stat on like the USA Today and you see in the bottom corner and they're like 56% of people like cake or whatever it is, um, that's just a gen pop. They sent out a survey, they get people to respond back and it just kind of is what it is. Um, but when you're asking very specific things um, and you're looking for a specific finding, if you talk to a general population of people, you're probably not gonna get out of it what you wanna get out of it. So you need to recruit based on very strict parameters. And that's what we did here. Like we, we recruited from, like there's warehouses that um, sign up people to participate in panels. Is anyone a member of a panel in here? Whether it's like an MPD panel, uh, Research Now is a panel. There's like a ton of panels that they pay you to take surveys. Um, and so what we did is we partnered with a couple different uh, groups like this. And what they do is they bring people on the panel, but they also watch their behavior and watch their answer to questions to kind of kick out the people who are just taking surveys to take surveys and they're just chalking answers. Um, but what we do is we work with them to recruit on very specific criteria. And what we did here is we had all these different buckets. And obviously like there was age parameters, there was gender mix we were looking for, there was region distribution, because we wanted to make sure that when we presented this work, that an owner didn't come in and go, well, you talk to 10 people who live in Minneapolis, and that's not really reflective of my market because I have a gym in Tampa, Florida. So we really wanted to be reflective of some sort of US base, but knowing that we talked to all these different groups. And so, when we did this ethnography and kind of followed it up with some uh, primary surveys and stuff like that, we found four different things, and we'll just talk about one, for instance, but we wanted to get our audience to kind of focus on, like, here are the big pain points. Like, recognize these are issues for your customers, and like T-Mobile, we can think about, are we gonna fix them and thrive and continue to move forward? Or are we gonna continue to stand pat on these and go, well, this is just the way we run our business, this is what we do, um, and slowly die? Um, so we get into, yeah, this is an important. So we get into this first stage, and what I wanted to do with each of these is I pooled all the different research we've done on shopping for a gym membership. And what I wanted the owners to do, like I said, was kind of put themselves in the mindset of a person shopping for a gym, because what they traditionally do is they go, well, no, my customer actually does this, and it's fine, like I still get new members, it's not a big deal but I wanted them to recognize, hey, like there are some gaps here and it is kind of a big deal. Um, so this is the ethnography that we did. We actually took the videos and we cropped them in such a way to like have them say what we wanted them to say. So it was kind of stacking the deck, but it was for all the right reasons. And then we just put it in a phone because they were videotaping themselves anyways. Um, and I'll just let you listen to this first one just so you get an idea of the types of things that we had them do and what they say. Um, you'll see this piece of paper because one of the exercise that we had them go through was kind of map out when they were gonna sign up for a gym, what are all the things that they do? And the reason why you have them go through this exercise is because if they just pulled out their phone and started talking, it'd be kind of like a jarbled mess. They'd say, well, yeah, I, I do this first and no, wait a second, and then I do that and I couldn't use the video to where if I actually have them map out exactly what they do and when they do it, they can talk better, or they can be more articulate while they're on video, so I can actually use the video um, as part of this. Yeah, and I don't have sound, but he kind of talks through, there's a, a couple different people who are talking here, and I kind of just blended them together. And they just talk about what they do when they're shopping for a gym. And there's no real rocket science here. Like that one guy was talking about, well, I go to the websites first, and these are the websites I go to, and here's what I'm looking for. And then I just kind of clipped and merged different pieces together so people could kind of talk about uh, all the steps that they take so that the audience had a good idea of what was happening. Um, some other data that we collected that says, you know, is continuing to validate. And it wasn't just the ethnography, it wasn't just the custom survey we did. It was all these different data sources that were pinpointing that the answer is we need to change. Um, and slowly we got you know, members to kinda, or owners to, to get on board. 
And then we took it back to us and we did some, we did some research on our web page through AdWords and Google Analytics to kind of say like how many people are coming to these local pages versus how many leave to kind of dictate that there's a problem there too. So all these things we have customers saying that or prospects saying that they, you know, they go to our websites, they can't find what they need. We have the data that says, so we're kind of triangulating all these different sources um, to really lay out that story. Um, so we did more ethnography here. What we had them do in this case is a lot of these uh, online ethnography research vendors, they have the ability to watch and track where people go on a website. So you can see where people hover their mouse, what they click on, and why they click what they click. And this was kind of eye-opening for the group as well because, you know, as you see this video clip go through, there's eight different people talking here. Um, and this was one that I really didn't have to massage at all because everyone was saying the same thing. When they would go to the site, they were looking for prices and they couldn't find prices there. And it was one person after the next, after the next. And again, the beauty of an ethnography is you watch their faces as they're kind of looking and they're puzzled. And like, I can't understand why I can't find the prices anywhere on the site and you just hear it in their voice. And as I was presenting it, I looked at the people in the audience and you could just see on their face like, crap, I don't, I don't have prices on my website either. So um, you could slowly see like through the research, through the voice of the customer activities that um, the clubs, the owners were realizing that there was a, there was a problem here. Um, this was one of my favorite ones because if we would have watched one of the videos, one of the ladies is like, um, you know, I, I'd call the club, but I don't really want to talk to them. And we snapshot her face. And that's what her face looks like when she's talking about calling the club. And, uh, you know, we kind of ask them, like, hey, does that look like the face of someone who's excited to join your club? And, you know, not really. Um, so we continue to, again, just belabor the point around there's a problem here um, and we need to fix it. And this is just more of the same. So we used uh, search words and things like that to figure out what people are searching um, and what they find when they're searching. And of our top 10 search terms, eight of them are around price. And they talk about what's a membership cost, what's the pricing, you know, any way you could say how much does a membership cost. Like these people have figured out how to say it. Um, and then I, went th I took them through an exercise like if you did that right now on your phones or computers and you Googled Anytime Fitness membership cost, you go to this page which is kind of uh, generic. It doesn't say how much a gym membership costs. Um, there's this third party site which scrapes gym membership pricing from different sites and puts it out there. Because we're a franchise organization, they all have different pricing. It's not necessarily like the Mankato Club's pricing or the Rochester Club pricing or the Minneapolis Club pricing. So then that sort of alerts some of the owners where like, well, if that's not my pricing and that was, that's what the customer thinks it is, you know, I'm gonna have to deal with that face to face. And then the last one is a review site called Piss Consumer. And this is where I really got their attention because they saw firsthand if, if my prospect is searching this and they go through this process and they get here, reviews, as you guys know, reviews and advocacy and all that stuff are so important in making a purchase decision. If you wind up here, what is the likelihood that you're gonna read this? Probably pretty likely. And what's the likelihood that you're gonna believe at least one thing that's put on there? Again, probably pretty likely. Um, and that's probably gonna deter you from joining whatever gym this is. And that's what I'm telling you, I'm like, they didn't have to get to this point. You just put a price online, like they never get to pissconsumer.com. And you can see how we're using different data sources, different ways of positioning the data that we slowly got an audience that was like, We've never put prices online. I don't put prices online. Like, I don't understand why to do it to, holy crap, I gotta keep people off pissconsumer.com. So again, like we just talked about all the places these people go and it's amazing that uh, prospects for our business try so hard to figure out what the prices are and we fight so hard to say, no, we're, we're not gonna give them to you. You gotta come into the club and talk to the the staff and things like that. So um, the good thing about doing market research and doing this kind of work is you have a seat at the table of what happens next. Um, and throughout my career, that's the most, I guess, um, 
excitement or passion that I've found in doing this work. It's not a whole lot of fun writing a survey. It's not a whole lot of fun cranking on data all day, but where it gets fun is you take those independent resources or you take the data that you gathered and you start crafting it into a story and you turn it into business objectives. Um, and that's what we did here is we took all that research around what's happening when a customer shops and turn them into, okay, here's what we need to do. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people, when you think about market research, you probably automatically think it's, I'm gonna write a survey, I'm gonna to have to do data analysis on a spreadsheet. Uh, but the reality is, is a lot of organizations, they want you to be able to take that data, turn it into a story, be able to articulate it, and get to some kind of findings and recommendations. And that's where some people struggle. But if you're gonna be good in this kind of space, that's where you need to excel. Um, so some of the things that we told them is like, hey, put your damn prizes online. Like, we kind of laid out some new web copy for them to use and different things. Um, we tested it, you know, before we had 2,000 clubs start putting their prices online. We put them on a subset and did some A and B testing around, well, what happens when you actually put prices online and the behavior that happens there. And there really was no negative change and they actually had a higher close rate. So people that understood your prices were more likely you could close them. Uh, the other thing is like do just some of the basics online. We have a lot of clubs that they just weren't doing it uh, and they weren't doing it well. Um, and then we decided earlier this year to revamp the site altogether um, to have a more user friendly interface and things like that. But you kind of get the gif, like we took the research and kind of turned it into like here are some actions um, for the end user. Because what happens is if you go through all this work and you really have no action, it's kind of worthless spending the time and money doing the research to begin with. So yeah, that's kind of the gist of that one. Did you guys have any questions on this one? We can move to the next one. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, is there like a difference in the reaction of a customer when he sees like buy a membership or like subscribe to a membership or between those two? In this case, we didn't do any like keyword testing. Um, because at the end of the day, the franchisees can write it however they want. I think there is perception. We've done more of it on like the contract side. So when I say contract to you versus agreement, like contract has a negative association versus agreement sounds a little different, even though the words are exactly the same. So I think there is a little bit of that, how you position things and how you write, um, because they do mean different things to different people. And because we're in an international environment and we try and create the most common language, but when we go from US to Canada or US to Australia or US to India, like some of those words and positioning change that we just have to be mindful of. Were there any other questions? For the marketing research team, are you guys all in Minnesota or do you collaborate with each other throughout the US to get this data together? So right now we're just in Minnesota. Um, so my team, we're based out of Hastings. Um, but when I worked at Best Buy, like the majority of the team was in um, Richfield at the corporate headquarters, but we had people in the UK, but we also use vendors that are all over the world as well. So you would just use like Skype or something to communicate with each other? Yep, so we have internal um, communication boards, but now because in a franchisee space we use Skype, um, because of firewalls and security and stuff like that, it's just easier to use Skype. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, so the next one I want to show um, was when I worked at Best Buy, if I can find my mouse, um, I had the opportunity to work on two um, Super Bowl ads. Um, and I actually gave this presentation a couple times to the Marketing 100 class before I got to adjunct um, teach. But I think this is a really interesting A from huge football fan and who doesn't like the Super Bowl but B, just to see how much work and effort from the marketing team goes into creating a $5 million 30 second spot. Um, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that it's not just the $5 million for the 30 seconds, but we started planning for the Super Bowl ad, so Super Bowl's in February. We started planning for it in April the year before. So where we started doing focus groups, we started refining concept, concepts, 
we had to figure out like what the, the offer or the product was gonna be because now you have Best Buys divided into product groups. So you have the mobile phone division, you have the computing division, you have the TV division, you have all these divisions who are like, well, hell yeah, I wanna be on the Super Bowl. And we need to figure out who's actually gonna be in that spot and what's gonna be the positioning. So, so it started, and I did this two consecutive years. Um, I think it was 2010 and 11, maybe. Um, but it was where Best Buy hadn't run a Super Bowl ad in years. And they were like, you know, hey, I think we want to spend the money. The marketing budget at Best Buy is like $500 million. Um, and they're like, we really want to make an investment here. What should we do? Um, and that's when the internal jockeying for positions and discussions started happening around, you know, what's the product going to be? What's the offer going to be? And how are we logistically going to get this to where it's a success? So, um, so, now nah, I want to skip that slide. So, it started with who's the target customer. And again, I worked on the mobile phone division and we didn't have a target customer per se, but we knew that the Super Bowl was going to give us a lot of visibility. So, it was going to give us 110 million households are going to watch this. It's going to give us a lot in consumer spending in terms of the people who are watching it and the associated spend that happens that week post or week prior to the Super Bowl. Um, so when you look at like who the target is, we didn't really have um, a defined demographic target. We had a defined more behavioral target. So because we were in the mobile phone division, it didn't matter if you were, you know, average age 35 uh, guy with two kids, because if you were not a contract, you were buying a phone anyway. So we were targeting a specific moment in time. Uh, for different people. But when we looked at the target for the Super Bowl ads, we kind of found different matches and pairings of things that kind of fit the type of person that we were selling to. Um, and then we had the conversation over the, the cost. When, when we ran the Super Bowl you know, uh, ad a few years ago, 30 seconds cost you $4 million. For the Super Bowl a month ago, the cost has already gone up to $5 million. So if you're a smaller organization, so Best Buy is fairly big and with a $500 million budget, you can afford to some extent, you know, eat this expenditure. But if you're some of the smaller organizations that you see on the Super Bowl, like this is go big or go home. Like they're really trying to get their message in front of as many people as possible. Product. So when we were looking at it from a Best Buy mobile perspective, you know, we had found through the purchase funnel tracker that less than one in 10 of consumers thought of Best Buy mobile when purchasing a phone. So then we looked at the Super Bowl as a great you know, um, uh, showcase to kind of talk to all those people that captured audience about why Best Buy Mobile or who Best Buy Mobile is and why they should buy. So again, a lot of different companies fall within, um, and again, this was from uh, the Super Bowl a couple years ago, but a lot of different brands fall and they advertise with a different marketing problem. So at the time, like no one knew who SodaStream was. Again, a, a rather small organization. They were willing to pony up the $5 million because they knew that they were gonna get a lot of visibility, they were gonna get a lot of eyeballs that were gonna see their ad. To where, you know, us, we were kind of down in that consideration purchase area. And then you have like the Doritos and the Budweisers, and as long as they're not launching a new product, they're just there to be there, to be part of the conversation. So there are three different types of ads that are approaches that we could have went with when we were developing the ad. And that was one of the things that it really wasn't research um, supported, but it was going to feed the types of research that we did. So if we were going to do a branding ad, that was going to influence the creative and the storyboards and things like that that we're going to go into research to kind of tell us how to refine that message to where if we were doing a promotion, we do a very different ad with very different subsequent marketing efforts behind that. Um, and typically when I, when I show this presentation, I look at some of the, the Super Bowl ads from the 80s. And if you ever have a chance, you know, because you've all seen Super Bowl ads from today, if you go back to this one, like this was one of the first um, more non-traditional uh, Super Bowl ads where it's a, it's a can of beer or a bottle of beer running through the woods. 
Um, and what they wanted to do is they had an awareness problem because Rainier Beer was you know, isolated up in the upper northwest and they didn't have a lot of awareness and they wanted to expand more broadly and they thought the Super Bowl was a great way to do it. Um, there are a lot of different philosophies that can go into you know, running the ad. Like, you see a lot more today than you did maybe 10 years ago that organizations want to make the most out of their investment of four or five million dollars. So, you know, a couple of years ago, cars.com started doing advertising three weeks leading up to the Super Bowl, creating anticipation. Because like us, we wanted to get the most bang for our buck. And what they did is they actually bought more media on top of their Super Bowl ad because they wanted to make the most out of that investment. Um, and then there's a lot of engagement now with social media during the game. Again, it's all about maximizing that original investment. And there are very few organizations today that advertise on the Super Bowl that don't do something surrounding the Super Bowl. Um, so we'll skip through some of this stuff. Um, so okay, going back. Um, oh, and we don't have sound either, but that's okay. Um, we started thinking about what the ad should be and we spent the whole summer um, kind of traveling the country doing focus groups and we were testing storyboards. How many of you know what a storyboard is? It's essentially where you take cardboard signs that have like mocks up, mock up of creative on them and you kind of tell the story one board to the next. So our creative team kind of mocked up what the storyboards looked like, what the story was within the storyboard, uh, in the storyboards. And we sat down with about eight to 10 people. And they would sit there and the person would go through each of the storyboards. And he would read the, the dialogue to the ad, very monotone, very you know, not to sway emotion or anything like that. Um, and then they would evaluate it after. We would ask them questions like, you know, would you consider Best Buy to buy a mobile phone from based on this ad? You know, what do you think of Best Buy after seeing this ad? All these types of questions that helped inform us around when we place the spot, is it gonna break through to people? Um, so we spent the summer doing focus groups and things of that nature, and we kind of landed um, on, there we go. Um, we landed on a couple different pieces of creative, and three of them were really, really bad, and one of them was okay. The first one, our ad agency, was the same ad agency that did uh, the Burger King, the King, you know, where he's got the fake head on and he's like laying in bed with that person and the person turns over and freaks. Like, the ad agency was all about shock value. And they, they felt like based on the other campaigns that they've done with big top tier clients, that if they could create some kind of shock value, that that's how you garner attention, especially on the Super Bowl. So they had one where um, Charlie Sheen, and this is back when you know Charlie Sheen was about, or just recently went off the rails. Um, but he found out that he needed to, uh, his contract was up and he had to buy a mobile phone and they just show him kind of losing his mind. The next set was they had Lindsay Lohan, again, like losing her mind, but they wanted to take like these polarizing characters, put them in the situation of buying a new mobile phone and just showing how terrible it is and if they would only went to Best Buy, that process was a lot better. Problem is, is what we found in the research is that generally people didn't like these characters to begin with. Um, so it was creating a lot of negative connotations to our brand. Um, so what we did is we kind of refined, you know, and there were a couple different uh, mock-ups that we had. And as we moved through the research and the storyboards went from just black and white drawings and as we kind of refined our concepts, they became more real. Um, we landed on one, and again, I, it's, it wasn't my favorite ad, it wasn't what I would have done, but I'm not the CEO of the organization, so I didn't really have a lot of say in it, but um, we landed on this one that was called Innovators, and the message that we were focusing on is that we were changing the way you bought a phone. So we brought in all these innovators in mobile phone technology, and they talked about how they changed the camera phone, the smartphone, and all these different aspects. And then a blue shirt came in and talked about, and this is how we're changing buying a phone, to try and resonate that, you know, A, people don't really like buying a phone outside of the excitement of getting the phone. We wanted to articulate that um, there was a better way or that you didn't always have to automatically go to the carrier, that you could try something different. Um, and this was the concept that we took um, to further refining. So again, about this time, it's September, 
and we took it to more focus groups, started getting it in video, and started doing more testing. Um, we did something really weird um, that I've never done before, but it was insightful, is there's a kind of research where you hook people up to the sensors, where you can see where their eyes go, and you can see all of their different emotional kind of triggers in their brain. Um, and what we found was, so this was like, this is an engagement quotient like right here. You can see as the ad went on, you can kind of see there's a peak in terms of where they were engaged. And then we found that they started falling off. And then this was their like an emotional quotient. And then there was something that happened right here that people, it got their attention. And I don't remember what it is that happened, but what we did is we took this research and we determined that the end of the ad kind of sucks. Um, and we had to change around what we did there. Um, so I don't remember exactly what they did, but we changed like the, the art card at the end and what happens there and tried to make it more entertaining. But um, I thought that was interesting. Um, and then we finalized the ad um, through research and then it went to production and does all the stuff that happens at the ad agency and things like that. But that's not where it ended because we needed to get all the other pieces in place. Because again, like cars.com in the beginning, it wasn't just about running the ad on Super Bowl Sunday, 30 seconds, cloud of dust, done. It was about how do you get the organization around it? Like Anheuser-Busch, there's a lot of like morale building that happens when you say, hey, I'm gonna be on the Super Bowl. Um, and when we have 150,000 employees um, across the US, there was a lot of energy that was happening here. Um, we did a lot in PR. So releases around what we were showing, why we were showing, what kind of offer we were doing. Um, we did a lot in digital retargeting and SEO. How many of you have heard digital retargeting? So how many of you go to amazon.com and look at a shirt and then you go to another website and the picture of that shirt is in the banner. So that's digital retargeting. And companies actually pay for certain products and services to be digitally retargeted, and that's what we did there. Um, we did some uh, search engine optimization, which you guys are all familiar with that. I see some nods. And so we did a lot there, and then our primary source of uh, visibility and income from that matter is the insert. So when you walk into the Best Buy, the little paper insert that's there, the one that comes in the Sunday paper. Any other questions? How do you know it failed? How do I know? I mean, hypothetically. Um, so we had a lot of uh, measures in place. So whether it was website traffic, we did a lot of like follow-up trackers. So again, going back to the purchase funnel tracker, during the Super Bowl, we, we normally did that a month at a time. During the Super Bowl, we actually did pre, right around that weekend, and then post to see were we moving any of those funnel metrics to change consideration. And then there was the financial metrics that were in place. Um, but another thing that we did that I didn't talk about is we had a, a gift card redemption in there that we tied directly to the spot. So we could tell how many people actually saw the spot or heard about the spot and then went to a landing page to sign up for a gift card. So we can kind of tie those metrics together. So if you didn't have the, the tie in there in general, almost any any promotional campaign's gonna have some kind of linkage to track the success or failure? So, especially at Best Buy, they did a lot of UPC mm -hmm. tracking to see when somebody bought something, does it tie? Right. And that's why, like, Best Buy, for example, how many are Reward Zone members? So, the thing about Reward Zone is that's an easy linkage from what you buy to a customer, or how many of you go to Hy-Vee and have the gas card? Like, that's another way an organization can pay you back a little bit, but then they know you and your purchase behavior as a customer. And that's how we can take analytics and look at these customers and their purchase behavior to determine, like, where do we intersect? And can we change purchase behavior? Because honestly, like, we know who you are as a customer and we can follow you through the system. Not to be scary, but, like, that's reality. Would you say like those reward cards are like the most effective tool to like analyze? Say say that again. Would you think that those like reward cards are like the most effective tool to analyze the data that you get? It's an input um, because you may not scan every purchase on your rewards or card, or you may go to Hy-Vee and you might not scan your gas rewards card on anything. Like you still need to have 
some kind of identifier. So for us at the mobile phone company, it was your mobile phone number. And those of you familiar, like there's the MIN, which is the number if you, know, you wanted to call me would be the number I gave you. But then there's the MDN that's in the back end. And that's the number that follows you through the system. So when we would do usage analytics or churn analytics, we would look at that MDN because it followed you everywhere and we could see you as one customer. Any other questions? What time do we have? It's like three. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I had one more, but that's the longest one. And it's more on how we took research and analytics to kind of inform our brand strategy on the waxing, uh, on the waxing business. But um, yeah, I appreciate your guys' time today. Uh, I hope, Thanks, hopefully I taught you guys something or you found something interesting. Uh, and the biggest thing like, I want to land with you guys is I have a lot of people who, when I talk to them about what I do, uh, they do view it as like number crunching. And I'm gonna tell you, like, that is not really the job. Like, if you view that as the job, it, it's not gonna be a fun career path for you. But if you view this as, you know, I wanna help inform business strategy, business direction and operations, like, that's how I view my job. Um, because I have a seat at the table in a lot of these discussions one way or another, either through a physical presence or the work that I do to make sure that what our customer experiences and what our customer does um, is actually portrayed within our organization. So um, I put my email on that first slide. Honestly, like, if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy uh, to answer. Um, but otherwise, I appreciate the time today. I have Greg's email too, so thank you very much. Yeah.